All right, well, good morning. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Philippians once again as we continue our series um, called Joyride, called Joyride. Everybody practice your cheesy church smile right now. You really got to put it on today on a gloomy, rainy Pittsburgh fall like today. Uh, It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. No, it's not, Mr. Rogers. No, it's not, but... This joy ride that we're on, right? This is not about the external things in life. It's about what Christ does for us internally. It's the things that last eternally. And so we're so thankful for all that the Lord has done for us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Come on, everybody say rejoice. Rejoice with a smile on your face. Come on, let's say rejoice. Hey, we have a great, great message, great text to jump into. Once again, I want to remind you of our Vintage Connect card. Please take some notes on the back. And uh, remember, this time is not just for this time. We want you to go and process this throughout the week, maybe in one of our incredible V groups. Um, Unpack this. It it hurts my feelings, but it is what it is. You guys are only going to remember about maybe 10% of everything I preach on a day, right? And so write it down, right? So you don't forget and process this with friends. We love sitting in circles as much as we love sitting in rows. And once again, if there's anything we can pray for you about, a decision that you've made, uh, you'd like to know some incredible next steps. We've got Vintage 101 after church today where we would love to connect with you. We are here for you. We're a movement of truth, love, and community. And we would love for you to be a part of this community. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Rob Wilton. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church and I wanna welcome you, especially if you're a first time guest. Can we give it up once again for our VIPs, our first time guests? If you are worshiping with us online, thank you for joining us. Uh, We love that you're worshiping with us online, but it's way more fun in the house. And so we'd love to see you in the house pretty soon. Hug your neck and get to know you and welcome you into our family. Um, Two weeks ago, we were in Philippians, and this was kind of what we proclaimed together. He exceeds. Everybody say, he exceeds. He exceeds. Remember, we reminded ourselves that Jesus is the greatest, right? He's greater than anything in this world, and he satisfies more than anything in this world. And so we considered that he exceeds as the apostle Paul reminded us, but whatever I thought was gain, I now count as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then last week we took a little bit of a break and we started to lay a foundation for where we're going in the future. And pastor Wes Weinbarger came here from Travelers Church and he preached a great message about kingdom partnership. And I want to encourage you to go online and watch that message. The thing that stuck out to me the most is, you know, God is looking for people who he can trust, right? Because he wants to entrust us with great things. He wants to entrust us with great things. And so let's jump back in. We're going to consider here today's text, this word, this proclamation, he sustains, he sustains. And we're going to look together in one of my favorite passages in all of scripture, Philippians chapter three, verse 12 through 14. Now to sustain, what does that mean? If he sustains to sustain, what does that mean? It's to strengthen or support or help reach a goal. Thank you for that dictionary definition, right? That is what it means to sustain. Now, As followers of Jesus, what is the goal? What is the goal? Here's the simple goal, you ready? It's faithfulness to God. That's the goal. The the goal is faithfulness to God, no matter what. Um, You and I were created, every single one of you. I promise you, when you entered into this world, God didn't look down from heaven and say, who's that? You are beautifully, wonderfully designed and created by God for a purpose. And yes, you could be a mom, you could be a dad, you could be a teacher, could be a coach, could be a financial advisor, could serve in the military. There's a number of things that you could do, but ultimately the greatest calling upon all of our lives is we were created with the purpose of faithfulness 
to God. I've shared this with you as your pastor. I have a very simple job description. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. You can steal that if you want to, because I don't care if you're a mom, if you're a student right now, if you're a teacher, if you're a business leader, if you're a real estate agent, whatever it is, I want you to know that's your job description too. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. Um, if you follow me on social media right now and go look at my Insta stories, um, I was pretty excited yesterday. My parents right now, remember Big Chief, he's been here and he's preached and my dad retired from ministry after serving the Lord um, in South Carolina at First Baptist Church of Spartanburg, South Carolina for 30 years. And I want you to know that word retirement, that's a joke. My dad has done anything but retire. And right now he's in the middle of a five week trip back home to where my family's from. I'm the first born in my family in America. My whole family's South African, okay? And my parents are back in South Africa a couple weeks ago. My dad had the privilege of preaching at my grandfather's church that he pastored, okay? And so we have a great legacy in our family. We celebrated, but the coolest thing happened yesterday, okay? Some of y'all might not even understand this. There's a sport called rugby, okay? I don't know if you've heard of rugby, but rugby is like football combined with soccer with what my dad says, no crash helmets, right? Uh, no helmets, no pads, and it's crazy. I mean, these guys are crazy. I mean, I was watching with my boys yesterday. Um, South Africa was in the Rugby World Cup final in France against the New Zealand All Blacks. Y'all heard of the haka, right? Ah, right? right, New Zealand All Blacks, okay? And so, truthfully, South Africa were underdogs, but if they won the World Cup yesterday, they would break a record for the most amount of World Cups, right, for any country, right? And so, man, we kind of watched, it was really cool, it was on at about three o'clock yesterday, but my dad sends me this video, my dad's sitting in this living room in South Africa, right, while they're playing this World Cup final, and he kind of spans around, and there's like a real deal fire, because I guess they didn't have heat in this house that they were in, you know, in the living room, and they're singing the national anthem for South Africa, and, and guys, I just want you to know, as I was watching that, could you imagine, some of y'all have never left Pittsburgh, and, and you've never been anywhere else, could, could you imagine how surreal that would be, like, you know, he moved here in 1979, so I can't even do the math, this was a long time ago, could you imagine coming back to Pittsburgh after that much time and being in Pittsburgh when the Steelers are playing in the Super Bowl, right? And then the national, y'all would start crying, right? You'd start thinking about, oh my gosh, right? Like I miss this place and I'm so, I just want you to know, I'm so thankful for my parents. I'm so proud of my parents. Um, my parents are, are kind of like, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of this, they're like heroes in my life. And I'm very thankful to have been loved by them and led to the Lord by them. And um, by the way, the, the Springboks won. They beat the New Zealand All Blacks yesterday. Go bo bokeh or bokeh or I don't even know, but go box, right? Um, show you how much of a South African I am. I don't even know how to cheer for them. But I guess I can claim we won, Right? And, and, you know, South Africa won, but like, as I'm thinking about this video that they showed us and pictures, and my dad called me right away after they won, he was like screaming like a girl, you know what I mean? He was so excited, so happy that his team won the, the World Cup. You know, when I thought about my, my parents, I'm thankful for their faithfulness to God. I'm, I'm thankful that ultimately their faithfulness was not to a country. Their faithfulness was not to their careers. Their, their faithfulness, with all due respect, because I was in their house, was not even to me, my brother, and my sister. Their faithfulness was to God. My parents, the prize for them has never been their job, their location, their possessions, their moment of leadership, their children. Their prize has been the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And as the Apostle Paul, from a jail, writes to the church at Philippi, 
after he had had a season with them and then the Lord called him somewhere else. After he had served faithfully, he's writing back to them to tell them, listen, I don't know exactly what God has in store for you specifically, church, but I know this. Remain faithful to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's read his words in Philippians chapter three, verse 12 through 14, because I want you to know each and every one of you were created for a purpose. And that purpose was and is to fulfill the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. I love that word, press on. Everybody say press on. I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we break down this text, Lord, we root ourselves in your faithfulness first. God, this is not a text that, that drives us to carry everything on our shoulders and to do everything for you. No, God, this is a text that reminds us of the truth that because Christ Jesus has made me his own, because of the faithfulness that you've showed to us, God, we are compelled to be faithful to you. And so Lord, I pray that you would stir within us a faith to trust you, to serve you, to press on toward you and the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us first. It's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, we're gonna talk about some practical things. I have five or six actual practical things. All right, I'm gonna kind of be Coach Rob. Coach Joe Rossi this week, has, this year, has, has given me a chance to, to yell at his football team at South Fayette this season, and I've loved every minute of it. And when he introduces me to come and speak to the team, he, he calls me Coach Rob. I think it's fantastic. I've always wanted to be a coach, right? And, and I've been able to, so I kind of feel like, man, this is a kind of message where it's like, man, let's huddle together. I'm, I'm about to yell at you some, some practical things, but let's remind ourselves of the gospel. What do we talk about when we talk about the gospel at Vintage Church? This is what we share. You can't. Oh, thank you, Pastor Rob. That's so encouraging. Yeah, that's where we start with the gospel. You can't, but guess what? Jesus did. And because Jesus did, now you can. The very essence of, of who Paul was and the message that he preached, he never just said, do this, do this, do this, do this, without a rooted focus on what God has done for you and what God empowers you to do for him. Y'all with me? And so let's not get into this because I'm gonna give you about five or six challenges on what it means to press on, what it means to pursue the upward call of God. And I pray that you take this on, but everybody look at me. You can't live for Jesus without Jesus. You can't do this without God. In fact, some of these steps I'm gonna give you today, the only reason why you're gonna be able to even make that step is because of God. He's the one that's going to be able to empower you. Anybody, as you've walked with Jesus, you don't have to raise your hand, but anybody want to testify today that as a follower of Jesus Christ, God has done for you what you could have never done for yourself or anybody else. I know I can testify. We could spend all day just in my resume showing you fail, 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 loser, 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 right? But God's showing up. 
I know he's done the same for you. And so before we take a next step, hey, if you're here today and you don't know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came, he lived, he died, he defeated sin, death, and hell so that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And God's word says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I'm about to share with you some things as a follower of Jesus we can do to pursue the upward call of God. But if you here today have not entered into God's presence through salvation in Jesus Christ, I invite you, even as I'm preaching right now, to bow your head and to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In just a few moments at the end of our service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond publicly, to lay it all at the foot of the cross thanking Jesus for the salvation of your soul. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are victorious. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, he sustains. How does Jesus sustain? Look at this on the screen behind me. This is how he sustains. This is the promise of the gospel. Before we talk about what it's gonna take to keep pushing forward, to keep pressing on, man, this is the promise. And this is something we should hitch our trailer to. This is something that we should never forget. This is something that we remind ourselves and preach to ourselves every single day day of our lives. I want you to know, how does Jesus sustain? Number one, he sustains over yesterday. Anybody thankful for the forgiveness and the redemption of your life in Christ Jesus? He has overcome so much for all of us. And so thank you, Lord. Because listen, the world will tell you, hey, it's not on your resume, therefore you can't. The world will tell you there's no way you could ever be forgiven for that. But what did we learn two weeks ago? He exceeds. See, he sustains over yesterday. Whatever I thought was gain, I now consider loss. Number two, though, isn't it great that it's not just a past promise, it's a present promise. He sustains throughout today. Anybody, even as we're gathering with believers on this rainy Pittsburgh day right now, feeling like the Lord's encouraging you right now? It's not about me. It's not about the music. Wasn't that music said so powerful? I mean, like, it's not about those things. It's about the Lord. Man, he's encouraging us right now. He's speaking to us right now. He's with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he comes to live within us. And he, as Jesus described the Holy Spirit, Thank you for being our helper. Thank you for walking with us, being with us. You see, he sustains throughout today. But aren't we thankful for the final point that he sustains into tomorrow? Everybody know exactly what's going to happen in your tomorrow? Nope, none of us do. (laughs) Right? I mean, Josiah has prophesied that the Packers are going to beat the Steelers. But we know that ain't going to happen. None of us can promise tomorrow. None of us. But because we have the book, can I tell you what is promised tomorrow? Jesus not only was, Jesus not only is, Jesus forever will be completely victorious. Thank you, Jesus, for sustaining into tomorrow. Let's read this text again, but I want to read it in its full context. And then I want to break down a few challenges for us as we are rooted in the gospel together. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 21. God's word says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature 
think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, who do we trust in? We trust the Lord. God will reveal that also to you. What's Paul doing there? I'm trying my best to preach to you, but at the end of the day, if I can't convince you of this, I know God can. <laughs> That's why at the end of the day, y'all know, I like to preach. I like to yell. I plan on sweating when I preach. I'm gonna try as best I can to not only lead you to Jesus, but to convince you to follow Jesus. At the end of the day, can I just assure you of something? I'm going to sleep tonight. And I'm gonna sleep really well, especially after a Sunday morning sermon. Do you know why? Because I actually don't trust or hope in myself. I trust in God. That's what he's saying here. He said, you know, basically some of you guys might not love this idea of what I'm talking about, but at the end of the day, I know God loves it. This is from him. And I trust his ability to reveal to you in his perfect timing. Some of you guys right now are faithfully sharing Jesus with a coworker. Don't, don't give up hope. God's word will not return void. Keep being faithful. Keep praying, keep trusting. The Lord wants to continue to advance. And so I love that in verse 15. That wasn't even in my notes. I've gave, I gave you that for free. That's like a bonus. Verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, now this is bold. Join in imitating me. You're so vain, Paul. You probably think, no, right? What's he talking about here? Well, what does Paul talk about all the time? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So when he says to people, hey, I want you to watch me. Actually, who's he telling people to watch? Jesus. Brothers, join in imitating me. We're gonna talk about how that helps us to press on. And do what? And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's gonna talk about how we together help each other press on. The Christian life is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. My boys were tripping out yesterday. Have you ever seen a rugby scrum? It's a team sport. It's locking in together. It's the power of multiple individuals coming together to one. This is what he's talking about here. And why do we need to unite together? We'll check out what happens in verse 18 here. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, some of the greatest wounds in life can come from people. Can I get a witness? Especially when those people at the core are enemies of God. And so we unite together, we lock together. Why? Because some have walked as enemies of the cross of Christ. Don't be fooled, church. If I don't get another chance to holler at you here in Pittsburgh, there are many people in this city, some who are not trying to do it on purpose, but there are many in this city who walk in this city as enemies of the cross. And they come in all shapes and sizes, religious, spiritual, agnostic, financial, the good things, the bad things. The enemy loves to disguise himself as a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so we need each other, don't we? At the end of the day, sadly, these enemies of the cross, what does it describe in verse 19? Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their passions, their desires. Belly there represents a person's longing for themselves. When I serve my belly, am I really serving anybody else? The way my oldest son Bolt here eats, he's eating on behalf of six people right now, right? But I hate to tell you, the burgers that he eats that's making me very poor as we speak, 
at every restaurant that we stop, I don't benefit from his eating. In fact, it's major loss in my life. So what is Paul talking about, right? When he says their God is their belly, their God is themselves. Everything's geared towards their accolades, what they get. And sadly, that is probably the, the greatest way in America the enemy is winning. We are taught to get ours. We are taught to be about ourselves. It's so selfish and it's so anti-God. We were not given these jobs, these professions, these bank accounts, this church for ourselves. May God forgive us as we look at the world tragedies and consider what's happening in the Middle East right now and look at that and say, oh, I wonder if this is gonna be a threat to America. May God forgive us for that selfishness. The core, he desires us to not feed our own belly, but to feed the world. That was extra too. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But, <laughs> I love the different buts that Paul puts in scripture. Somebody tweet that. But, our citizenship is where? Is in heaven. And from it, wasn't that beautiful what Phoebe was just singing? We wait for you. We wait for you. So powerful. Because on this side of heaven, you might not get what you want. So we wait for you, Lord. We're content in trial. We're content in unanswered prayers. We're content in tribulations. We're content even when we put all of our chips in to a career that we thought was gonna make us fully happy. Did y'all see that Matthew Perry passed away? One of the friends, I know some of y'all have never watched Friends. Me and my wife, we've seen every Friends episode over and over. Matthew Perry Chandler on the show. I think he said basically that he prayed a very foolish prayer very empty prayer when he wanted to be famous. Because at the core, he found out that fame wasn't all that. If I could just be famous, if I could just be rich, if I could just have the things this world has told me is it. Our citizenship is in heaven. And on this side of heaven, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, because he was victorious, he is victorious, he forever will be victorious, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. All right, get ready. Some notes. We're going to fly through these. There's two important things as I unpack some action points for us because now we are convinced. I hope you're convinced. So that was my best effort. If you're not convinced, then I don't know. Find somebody else that he sustains. He wants to sustain. He wants you to accomplish great things. He wants you to have joy, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He doesn't want you to just have life. He wants you to have life to the fullest. And so because he sustains, I'm gonna give us some action points here that we're gonna break down. But let me just share two things to consider before we jump into the practical today. Y'all ready? 
First of all, this. This is about a journey that has different levels. And this is a journey that will actually never be complete until we are united with Jesus. So there will never come a time, okay? Let's take the second. There will never come a time where you will say, no more pressing on, I've made it. <laughs> oh, I've arrived, I am the perfect Christian. Never. Now this is true for everyone in the world except my mama, I'm just kidding. Are y'all with me? You, you will never, some of y'all are, are clicking on all cylinders in terms of your walk with Jesus. This is a verse for you. Don't settle. Oh, I've arrived, man. I'm, I finally, can I tell y'all something in church world? I finally got my doctorate. I mean, can't y'all see the, the glory of God just resonate on my face because I'm Dr. Rob Wilton and I've arrived? I got nothing else to learn. I got so much to learn. I've told y'all, my grandfather on his deathbed, 90 something years, preached 50 plus years, one week before he died, showed me something new he learned from the book of Romans. We'll never get there. But now let me speak to this. We're all at different levels, aren't we? Some of us have walked with Jesus a long time. And as I'm preaching this text, you're yawning because you're like, I could do it better. Some of y'all in this room, you're like, I've never heard this verse, but I love it. This is something new and fresh in my life. Y'all with me? We're all at different levels, and so we show grace and mercy to one another. We help out each other. We serve each other. So are we clear as we jump into this? There's, there's not going to ever be a time where we don't press on. Right? On this side of heaven or when Jesus comes again. Secondly, let's honor and respect and love everyone at every place. Do you know that when I get up to preach, some of you guys get really frustrated when I say the simple things. Why won't he just get into the deep stuff in God's word? I ain't just thinking about you. Because every week I anticipate that there's someone in these seats that maybe has never even opened up a Bible. And so I fully intend, okay, everybody look at me. I fully intend to not discriminate here at this church. I want to equally frustrate everyone in this place. I hope you're okay with that. Because I'm trying in this moment to connect with all the levels. What's most important for me is that in all of our levels, y'all with me? We keep pressing on. All right, so how do we do that? Because he sustains, y'all ready? Write these down. You're not gonna remember them. Write these down. Get out your phones, whatever, write them down. And start yelling at you if you're not writing them down. Number one, press on. Everybody say press on. All right, that's the first reminder, right? Right here in the text, because he sustains, press on. So highlight verse 12 and verse 14. It says, first of all, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. There's Paul's emphasis. You will never arrive. Okay, anybody think Paul was legit? Y'all do understand. He comes through those doors. I'm sitting down, handing him the mic. Like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not preaching with that guy in the, in the room. Like, no, you get this. Pastor Paul, this is your thing, right? So does it humble anybody to know that he says that he hadn't arrived? <laughs> that he said he's still got to work on some things? That he said that he's not already perfect? Y'all with me? All right, so I don't think we have any Apostle Pauls in the room. So we definitely got to keep moving forward. But what do I do? In my imperfection, in my struggle, in the battle, in, I press on to make it my own. Why? 
and rooted in the gospel because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul says, I'm not trying to live for Jesus without Jesus. No, the only chance I got to live for Jesus is because of Jesus. Y'all with me? He's going to empower me to press on. You know, that speaks to calling. Everyone has a specific purpose. Everyone has a specific calling. We've got to examine in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit what it is that God has entrusted us with. Paul says, I press on. But then he starts to talk about the prize, not just calling, but prize. Look at verse 14. He says, I press on and where am I going? I'm not going to get a doctorate at a seminary. I'm not going to be a great teacher. I'm not going to necessarily get that incredible job and career. I'm not going necessarily for that relationship. Where am I headed as I press on? Well, there's a prize. Everyone's calling is connected with the one calling. And what is that one calling? We've talked about it, verse 14. I press on toward the goal. Everybody say goal. The goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All right, number two, shake off. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Right? That's old school, Taylor Swift. Shake off. One of the things that you've got to do as you press on in Christ Jesus is you've got to shake off. Verse 13, Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So what do we shake off? Everybody look at me. First thing we shake off, successes. Just because... You did it here doesn't mean you're going to do it there. Just because things happen in a certain way there doesn't mean it's going to happen here. Y'all with me? Pride comes before the fall. People want to default in this text always talk about failures. We'll talk about that in just a minute. No, successes. (laughs) These are the dads I hang out with every week at football games. They love telling me about how they were an All-American in middle school. (laughs) It's pretty funny. Me and one of my neighbors this week, we had fun. Thinking about the glory days. You know how much I tell the boys? (laughs) Your daddy did it this way. Why don't you do it this way, right? We all have our successes. Can I tell you one of the reasons? I'm gonna make some of my friends in New Orleans mad. One of the reasons why the Saints have only won one Super Bowl (laughs) because they celebrated the one Super Bowl we won as if they'd never win a Super Bowl again. (laughs) Like, the only thing they ever talk about. I mean, if we lose to the Falcons, which I call the fail cons, when we lose to the Falcons, okay, um, all my Saints fans, all my Saints fans, like, they always say, yeah, but we have a ring and you don't. I mean, that's our, our default on everything. You know, in New Orleans, we would tell our people in our church to put their phones on Falcons mode, no rings, right? I mean, that, that's, what we would, that's what we would talk about. And, and so, look, successes can become something that actually prevents us from being where we need to be. Everybody look at me. There's no such thing as glory days. There's God's glory. So I, I love your resume, I love what you've done, but, but don't hold on to that. God's got a greater purpose in store for you. But let's talk, can we talk real quick, failures? There, there is this fact in this room, most likely, that some of you in this room aren't stepping into the promises of God in the future because of the wounds of the past. And may I submit to you, our God is a God of redemption new beginnings, new wineskin, new starts. And he wants to unleash upon you a fresh newness. And he offers to you a forgiveness that offers to you peace that passes all understanding. 
Everybody look at me. Two weeks ago, we talked about how God exceeds. No sin in your life is too great for our God to overcome. Lay it at his feet and walk in newness of life. All right, shake off. Number three, get low. I'm not gonna sing that song. <laughs> Y'all are getting a little taste of, of Pastor Rob's uh, playlist. <laughs> get low, get low, get, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Rob, be spiritual. Verse 15, get low. What am I talking about here? Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, you think otherwise. God reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Okay, so there's two things I wanna highlight here. Maturity. Maturity. Contrary to what our politics in America are teaching us right now, Jesus would say the greatest is the servant. The greatest is not those who rule and reign and boss and have the power. No, Jesus would say the greatest among you is the servant. And I'm sorry, but let me, can I just pick on pastors? I mean, there's a lot of people picking on pastors. But let me throw another jab to the reality of pastor world. There's a lot of pastors that have forgotten that. Greatness is not defined in platforms. Greatness is defined in humility, in servanthood. Jesus was the model. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, humbled himself. Everyone wants a title and a position and impact. But guys, true maturity is not just found in humility, but it's found in hard work. It's, it's found in hard work. Everyone wants the platform, but no one wants the work that it takes to have the platform. Pastor West last week, God wants to trust you to entrust you. One of our problems in church world today is everybody thinks because they got an Instagram page, they can pastor a church right now. Like, no, there's time that needs to be spent. There's training. There's all these different things that we need to do. Yes, God uses us despite us, no doubt. But when it comes to maturity, guys, this is going to take time in your life. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And how through time does God shape and mold us? It's truth. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we've attained. God's word hurts. God's word shapes. God's word leads. So we hold true to the word of God, not the word of a denomination or a word of even a pastor or a word of mama, and I'm a mama's boy. No, we hold to their words if it's the word. The word will not return void. Get low. Spend your mornings, instead of trying to lift you up with great posts on social media, spend your mornings on your knees under this powerful word of God. Get low. Number four, lock in. How do we press on, church? We need each other. We gotta do this together. Lock in, lock in. Verse 17 through 19, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now even tell you with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. And so number one, think about examples. 
Paul offers himself up as an example to be imitated. Join in imitating me. What is Paul talking about here? This is not something where he's putting himself up on some pedestal. He's talking about the importance of discipleship. He's talking about the importance of sacrificing for you to even say, hey, imitate me. What are you doing? You're actually dying to yourself and your agenda that's all about you. And you're sacrificing time each and every day to say, you know what? I've got someone who's going to come ask me questions. I've got someone who I've got to take time with and meet over lunch. I've got someone that I need to lovingly walk through the word with. That's what he's doing there. He's talking about the mission of one anotherness in scripture. We can't be about the one. We gotta be about one anotherness. And here, he talks about discipleship. I'm so thankful to be in a church that has so many great examples of people who are trying their best to follow Jesus. Find someone, church family, that's ahead of you. Those of you who have new babes you know, God's bless you a little. Tri- Find, you know, an OG parent. Teach me your ways. These kids be crazy. You'd be amazed, guys, at how many older pastors I talk with every week. I crave their input in my life. Who's ahead of you? Who's with you? Who's with you? Who's right there in the same world not sleeping at night because kids are keeping you up, right? Find those people, man. Lock in with them. Who's behind you? Not in a disrespectful way, but y'all heard me say, having boys in my life that clearly need to go to the bathroom 60 times while daddy preaches on a Sunday, having boys in my life, right, puts me at a position where I need to be on guard, Y'all with me? Like that puts pressure on me, good pressure. The way I talk to their mama, I very quickly start hearing them talk to their mama the same way. Uh Uh-oh. So dad in the house, how are your kids talking to your wife? You're probably the problem. See that pressure? I want someone to actually be behind me because it's helping me grow to become like Christ. And so ahead of me, with me, behind me. Now here's what's cool about this. If Paul would say, "Um, I'm in this situation right now, not perfect, and he was doing it, so can you. This is not about finding the perfect person ahead of you, the perfect person with you, the perfect person behind you. No, get in the game and all of you press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Lock in. To once again just share what I've stated already. Why do we need each other? Why do we need to lock shields of faith? Because there's enemy. And the enemy is gonna do everything he can to convince you to quit to not press on. We need each other, don't we? I need you, you need me. But we close with this, this is the final point. Look up. Look up. Let's practice that right now, everybody look up. I think, I think doing something physically is a, is a good memory moment for you. Look up. An old you know, saying, don't look at the wind and the waves. Look at the one who controls the wind and the waves. For me, I stop pressing on. For me, I get discouraged. For me, I want to quit sometimes when I'm not looking up. What Paul says, oh, by the way, oh, oh, by the way, in a jail cell. (laughs) What was he looking at when he's doing this? I hate to tell you, he ain't standing on a beautiful platform in a beautiful church with air conditioning and lights on. And most of you guys, most of you have been pretty friendly to preach to today. (laughs) Like, that's not what he's looking at. I can do this right now. I'm like, press on. Look at that smile. Oh yeah, that person's in my corner. Oh yeah, man, I'm ready to charge hell with a water pistol right now. 
as I'm looking at you. How many of y'all believe though, when we leave these doors, Monday through Friday, when we start to look around, we could maybe get a little discouraged. Look up. For the apostle Paul closes this with saying, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Thank you, Lord. I'm not gonna have knee problems in heaven, balling on streets of gold. You're gonna take all imperfections on this side of heaven and redeem them. Thank you, Lord. How is this possible? By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Do you know a little side note about that? I I need y'all to know this because there's a lot of people against Team Jesus in the world today. Can I tell y'all something from Revelation? All will bow. (laughs) Some of you are like, oh, we're losing. I don't know if we're gonna win this thing. Revelation tells us all will bow. All hail King Jesus. Look up. Look up. And as you look up, thank the Lord for the work that he's doing right now in you. Anybody want to thank the Lord for the victories you're experiencing today? I know I am. I'm thankful. But also anticipate and look up knowing that the work that He has begun in you, He will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we bow before you and we thank you for this promise, for this word. Lord, empower us through your faithfulness. Oh God, you are faithful. To be faithful and to press on towards the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.